Hello and welcome to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview uh, for our YouTube channel and uh, this time we're talking to Geoffrey Archer. This was a ticketed event from uh, three days ago. Um, I was chatting to uh, Geoffrey about his latest series of books uh, of which he's now on book two. Book one was Nothing Ventured and uh, it tells the story of William Warwick. Uh, William Warwick appeared in the Clifton Chronicles uh, and he's now moved on to book two which is uh, hidden in plain sight. We've got uh, a stash of signed copies of this uh, in the shop. Now um, Geoffrey was very kind enough to read from his book, uh, a planned two or three minute reading turned into uh, the entire first chapter. So if you want to miss that bit just fast forward 13 minutes and, uh, and then the interview starts. I do hope you enjoy the interview. The 14th of April, 1986. The four of them sat around the table staring at the hamper. Who's it addressed to? asked the commander. William read the handwritten label. Happy birthday, Commander Hawksby. You'd better open it, E.C. Warwick, said the hawk, leaning back in his chair. William stood up unfastened the two leather straps and lifted the lid of the huge wicker basket that was packed with what his father would have called goodies. Clearly someone appreciates us, said DCI Lamont, removing a bottle of scotch from the top of the basket, delighted to find that it was black label. He also knows our weaknesses, said the commander, as he took out a box of Monte Cristo cigars and placed them on the table in front of him. Your turn, D.C. Roycroft, he added, as he rolled one of the Cuban cigars between his fingers. Jackie took her time removing some of the packing straw before she discovered a jar of foie gras, a luxury way beyond her pay grade. And finally, D.C. Warwick, said the commander. William rummaged around in the hamper until he came across a bottle of olive oil from Umbria that he knew Beth, his wife, would appreciate. He was about to sit back down when he spotted a small envelope. It was addressed to Commander Hawksby, QPM, and marked personal. He handed it to his boss. Hawksby ripped the envelope open extracted the handwritten card. His expression revealed nothing, although the unsigned note could not have been clearer. Better luck next time. When the card was passed around the table, smiles turned to frowns, and the recently acquired gifts were quickly returned to the hamper. You know, what it makes it worse, said the commander, is it is my birthday. And that's not all, said William, who then told the team about the conversation with Miles Faulkner at the Fitzmolian soon after the unveiling of the Rubens painting, Christ Descending from the Cross. But if the Rubens is a fake, said Lamont, why don't we arrest Faulkner? Send him back to the Old Bailey, and Mr. Justice Norse can remove the word suspended from his sentence and lock him up for the next four years. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, said Hawksby. But if the painting turns out to be the original, Faulkner will have made a fool of us a second time and in the most public of arenas. William was taken by surprise by the commander's next question. Have you warned your fiance that the Rubens might be a fake? No, sir. I thought I'd say nothing to Beth until you decided what course of action we should take. Good, let's keep it that way. It'll give us a little more time to consider what our next move should be because we have to start thinking like Faulkner if we're going to bring the damn man down. Now get that thing out of my sight, he demanded, pointing at the hamper, and make sure it's entered in the gratuitous register. 
but not before it's been checked for fingerprints. Not that I expect the dab's expert to find any prints other than ours, and possibly those of an innocent sales assistant from Harrods. William picked up the wicker basket and took it into the next room, where he asked Angela, the commander's secretary, if she'd send it down to P705 for fingerprinting. Couldn't help noticing that she looked a little disappointed. I was hoping to get the cranberry sauce, she admitted, when he returned to the boss's office a few minutes later. He was puzzled to find the rest of the team banging the palms of their hands on the table. Have a seat, Detective Sergeant Warwick said the commander. Choir boy is speechless for a change, said Lamont. That won't last long, promised Jackie. And they all burst out laughing. You want to hear the good news or the bad news? Asked the commander once they'd all settled down. The good news, said DCI Lamont, because you're not going to enjoy my latest reports on the diamond smugglers. Let me guess, said Hawksby. They saw you coming and have all escaped. Worse than that, I'm afraid. They didn't even turn up and neither did the shipment of diamonds. I spent an evening with 20 of my men, armed to the teeth, staring out to sea. So do tell me the good news, sir. As you know, DC Warwick has passed his sergeant's exam, despite kicking one of the anti-nuclear protesters in the, I did nothing of the sort, protested William. I simply asked them politely to cool down. Which the examiner accepted without question. Such is your choir boy reputation. So what's the bad news? Asked William. In your new role as a detective sergeant, you're being transferred to the drug squad. Rather you than me, said the monk with a sigh. However, continued the commander, the commissioner in his wisdom felt a winning team should not be broken up. So you two will be joining him as part of an elite drug unit on the first of the month. I resign, said Lamont, leaping to his feet in mock protest. I don't think so, Bruce. You only have 18 months left before you retire, and as the head of the new unit, you'll be promoted to detective superintendent. The announcement provoked a second eruption of enthusiastic banging on the table. The unit is to work separately from any existing drug squad. It only has one purpose, which I will come to in a moment. First, I wanted to let you know that the team will have a new DC added to its complement, who may even outshine our resident choir boy. I want to see that, said Jackie. But you won't have long to wait. He's joining us in a few minutes. He has an outstanding CV, having read law at Cambridge, where he was awarded a blue in boat race. Did he win? asked William. Two years in a row, said the hawk. Then perhaps he should have joined the river police, said William. If I remember correctly, the boat race takes place between Putney and Mortlake, and he'd be back on the beat. It's a less elicited, more banging on the table. I think you'll find He's just as impressive on dry land, said the commander, after the applause had died down. He's already served three years with the regional crime squad in Cawley. However, there's something I ought to mention before a sharp knock on the door interrupted the hawk before he could finish his sentence. Enter, he said. The door opened and a tall, handsome young man entered the room. He looked as if he'd stepped straight off the set of a popular television police drama rather than just arrived from the regional crime squad. Good afternoon, he said. I'm DC Paul Adeja. I was told to report to you. Take a seat, Adeja, said the hawk, and I'll introduce you to the rest of the team. William watched Lamont's face closely as Adeja shook hands with an unsmiling superintendent. 
The Met's policy was to try and recruit more officers from minority ethnic backgrounds, but to date, it had not been it had been about as successful in that ambition as it had been in arresting diamond smugglers. William was curious to find out why someone like Paul had even considered joining the force and was determined to make him quickly feel part of the team. These SIO meetings are held every Monday morning, DC Adeja said the commander, to bring us all up to date on how any major investigation is progressing. Or not progressing, said Lamont. Let's move on, said the hawk, ignoring the interruption. Is there any more news on Faulkner? His wife, Christina, has been in touch again, said William. She's asked to see me. Has she indeed? Any clues? No, sir. I've no idea what she wants, but she makes no secret of the fact that she's just as keen as we are to see her husband behind bars. So I don't imagine she's suggesting tea at the Ritz, simply to sample their clotted cream scones. Mrs. Faulkner will be aware of any other criminal activities her husband has been involved in, which would be useful for us to know, said Lamont, especially if it's in advance. But I wouldn't trust the woman an inch. Neither would I, said Hawksby. But if I had to choose between Faulkner and his wife, I consider her the lesser of two evils, but only by half an inch. I could always turn the invitation down. No way, said Lamont. We may never get a better chance to put Faulkner behind bars. And don't let's forget, however minor the offence, because of the judge's suspended sentence, it would put him inside for at least four years. True enough, said the hawk. But yes, Warwick, you can be sure Faulkner will be watching us just as closely as we're watching him. And he's certain to have a PI tailing his wife right around the clock until the divorce is finally settled. So while tea at the Ritz is acceptable, dinner is not. Do I make myself clear? Abundantly, sir. And I'm sure Beth would agree with you. And never forget that Mrs. Faulkner's slips of the tongue have always well rehearsed. She's also well aware that everything she tells you will be repeated word for word the moment you arrive back at the yard probably even before her chauffeur has dropped her off in her flat in Eaton Square, added Lamont. Right, let's get back to the matter in hand. There are several cases you have to brief the new Art and Antique squad on before you start work on your new assignment. You were about to tell us, sir, before, AD, before DC Adetra joined us, how the new unit will differ from any other existing drug squad. I can't tell you too much at the moment, said the hawk. You will only have one purpose. And it won't be to catch low-level dealers selling cannabis on the street to potheads. Suddenly, everyone was wide awake. The commissioner wants us to identify a man whose name we don't even know and whose whereabouts we can't be sure of, other than that he lives and works somewhere south of the river in the greater London area. However, we do know what his day job is. The hall opened a file marked top secret. Hurrah, hello, Jeffrey. Hi. How are you? That was the first chapter. <laughs> I know, I think you, you read probably um, three times longer than I think we'd, um, well. I apologize. We'd planned, but you know what? That was lovely. Um, in that first chapter, you've sort of set up the fact that um, Miles Faulkner is a bit of an oily one and uh, he seems to be able to get away with anything. You've also introduced the whole drugs thing and you've introduced ethnicity as well. Well done you. I mean, that's an that's a extraordinary achievement. Well, I'm, I'm very aware that uh, police in those days did not have many uh, ethnic officers and they're trying very hard now and indeed they're succeeding. So I thought if I could introduce uh, a young police constable who uh, was from Nigeria actually, as we find later, 
who will become a close friend of William Warwick, uh, that would add to the story. Fantastic, fantastic. Good, so formal introduction, I think that's probably uh, in, in, uh, needed. Uh, Lord Geoffrey Archer, 20, 275 million books sold, extraordinary. 28 books written, um, is this the 28? 19 number one bestsellers. Um, what else? What else is there left to do? Surely you've you're you're so fit. You're 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 happy. Don't be so pathetic. <laughs> I'm only eighty. <laughs> I intend to go on working until I fall. Fantastic. And how many how many William Warwick books are we uh, are we well, going to? William uh, starts. William starts as as you know. Um, as a constable. Father doesn't want him to join the Metropolitan Police Force. His father, a distinguished QC, wants him to become a lawyer like himself and go into chambers. But he has always wanted to join the Metropolitan Police. So he defies his father, joins the police, and in the first book, Nothing Ventured, you see him as a constable working his way into becoming a detective. And the first book is Art and Antiques. He joins the Art and Antique Squad, and you see him looking for a stolen Rembrandt worth several million. But I'm going to take him from Detective Constable to Detective Sergeant, which he is in the second book, Hidden in Plain Sight, is the drugs story. So each book will be a separate subject and a separate book. You can pick up anyone you like. But the second one is drugs. It so does feel third, like in, he will in, become. In, in nothing ventured, it does feel like his um, his uh, his rise is stratospheric. Almost, uh, he goes from you know walking the beat to um, to 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 doing some fairly heavyweight stuff uh, very quick. I suppose that serves your purpose as a, a storyteller. It serves my purpose, number one. But number two, it true, it is true that if you enter the police force with a degree, as he does. And don't forget, it was a degree in, in uh, art. Uh, if you enter the police force at a degree, your rise can be very quick indeed, not unlike the British Army in the Second World War, where you really do move if you have a degree. So yes, his rise will be quick uh, because he is an exceptional young man. Mm, fantastic. So uh, we'll dip in and out of it. There's, there's all sorts of questions that I've, I've got for you. Um, if, if I'm allowed, can I just ask you, at what point did you decide to become a storyteller? What, at what point did you, uh, in your life, did you always know it was in you or was it sort of driven by circumstance? I always thought I was a raconteur. I always enjoyed telling stories. But it wasn't until I left the House of Commons facing amazing deaths and thinking I was going to go bankrupt, luckily I didn't go bankrupt, that I sat down and wrote my first book, Not Any More, not a penny less. And for those people this evening who are thinking of writing a book, uh, let me say that 14 publishers turned down, not a penny more, not a penny less. And it was published by the 15th publisher, Jonathan Cape. Tom Mashler believed in it and published it. And uh, he printed 3,000 copies. And they just about sold out worldwide, just about sold out. So those stories that I keep reading, that not a penny more, not a penny less, was an instant bestseller, absolutely untrue. Uh, the breakthrough was the third book, Cain and Abel. That, that sold a million in the first week, and that did change my whole life. And you got the uh, and TV deals and all film de deals and all sorts of stuff. That was uh, that's a, it's a hell of a hell of a thing you've managed to do. And can I can I also just say a quick thank you for the fact that you're even talking to um, talking to us. We're sort of bookended by uh, the New Statesman yesterday and uh, Capital Crime tomorrow. So uh, you sparing some time for a little independent bookshop in 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 well rainy tring. I was going to say sunny tring uh, is is most uh, gratefully received. And, and huge thanks to your publicist as well for. Uh, no, I, I'm delighted because I'm very aware that are among the many things that have happened because of COVID and because of uh, coronavirus, bookshops have had a hell of a time. I spoke to a bookshop in Durham the other day 
where the lady told me they hadn't had one customer for four days. Uh, and that's really tough, really tough. Mm. And so any help I can give to Small Book, only too delighted, would be a terrible thing at the end of all this. We came out of all this and the, say, several of our bookshops had had to close. That would be terrible. Yeah, I mean, I can't um, can't talk about that Durham one. I can't believe that actually. But uh, but actually, I found in lockdown, people have been reading more, um, and actually, are if anything, are uh, we've been doing better. Um, having said that, I only opened year, a year last September, so I can't really comment on. No, no, my comment was that how many people came into the shop. He did tell me that they were selling online, okay. and they were sending books out, but no one was coming into the shop. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I mean, 28 books, is it you've launched it? Are you still as excited about launching books as you were at the start? Oh, yes. It never, it, I, I love the first day you see the cover. I love the first day you see a proof. I love the first day you see a book. I think if that isn't a thrill any longer, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and luckily, it is still a thrill, and I still love doing it. So uh, during coronavirus, where I was stuck for 144 days, unable to leave the house other than for one hour to go for a walk, mm. during those 144 days, I wrote uh, from 6 to 8 in the morning, from 10 till 12, from 3 till 5, six hours a day, 144 days, just over 900 hours I was writing, and I walked 500 miles. So I used being locked up in, the, in, in lockdown uh, to write and actually wrote a completely new book. The third book, the next one out, uh, was written during those 144 days. Wow, wow. So um, thank you so much. Uh, let me... Um take you to the Clifton Chronicles, which I think is where you yourself say, even on the cover, it's uh, inspired by the uh, Clifton Chronicles, both of the, the first two William Warwick books. Um, for those, of, for those of, uh, of the audience unfamiliar with the Clif Clif Clifton Chronicles, and I, I sure there aren't, I'm sure there aren't that many, um, can you give a brief summary um, uh, as to, uh, uh, about the background and how it inspired the William Warwick series. Yes, certainly. Ben. At the age of 70, 10 years ago, I was very frightened of that being what the Bible calls uh, three score year, years and 10, and in theory, the end of your life. So I thought I've got to do something that gets me up every morning, keeps me inspired, and I enjoy it. So wrote the uh, Clifton Chronicles. I told my publishers originally, I thought I could do it in three. The problem was that Harry Clifton and Emma and Giles were only 40 at the age, uh, at the end of the third book. So I went back to the publishers and said, I think I can do it in five. When I got them to 50 after five, mm -hmm. I said, I think I can do it in seven. So it, it ended up being seven books, and, I, and uh, there I was at the age of 77. And I was getting letters from all over the world saying, in the Clifton Chronicles, you have Harry Clifton, a writer, and you write his story from the day he's born to the day he dies. And in it, you have put many of your own experiences because you're a writer. But Harry Clifton's hero, his eponymous hero, is in fact, uh, a man called William Warwick. And many of them were saying, please, can we have a William Warwick story? So I went away and thought about that and came up with this idea of this young boy at school deciding he would be a detective and taking him, if I live long enough, taking him from being uh, a constable all the way through to being commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. But I will have to live to the age of 85 to make sure he becomes commissioner. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't, I, I've heard of one or two interviews with you talking about making him commissioner. In the books, you're not quite so blatant about it. It's, it's a lot more subtle and he's a lot more kind of um, modest, I think you'd say. But um, so the moment I saw, I saw an interview with you today earlier saying, um, oh yeah, gonna make him commissioner. And that's, that was a revelation to me actually. Ah, well, he is modest. 
He's based on a man called John Sutherland, who was a detective superintendent in very sad circumstances, had to resign from the Metropolitan Police in what he described in his quite brilliant book, he described as one murder too many. He broke down, he was in charge of the murder squad and he broke down. And when I met him, I met him at a church service, an Advent carol service when he was reading the lesson. And I asked if he would be kind enough to be my researcher and advisor. How could I have someone? He'd been in the police for 30 years. And uh, he wasn't sure he'd got over it completely. He wasn't sure he was back to being. And then he wrote and said, yes, I'd like to try. So he joined the team. And the second person, I was extremely lucky, um, a remarkable woman called Detective Sergeant Michelle Roycroft. She became my other, they couldn't be more different. So you had this amazing woman who had worked in the drug squad, worked in the murder squad at one end, but reached detective sergeant. And at the other end, I had chief superintendent, John Sutherland, who everyone said was heading to the very top before the collapse. And they both came on the team. So when I'd finished the third or fourth draft, I sent it to them. And of course they were able to correct silly mistakes so that I didn't have people writing in saying, well, you can't do that and you can't do that. So at that level, they were marvelous. And then they added, for those people watching this, I had in the second book, John said, I want to introduce you to the head of the drug squad. He's just retired. and I want to introduce you to another detective superintendent, Paul. And Paul came to see me. So he taught me about, because I don't smoke or drink, so he literally had to teach me. He taught me about marijuana, cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, and all the facts and figures about how many people take marijuana, five million in Britain, how many people take uh, crack cocaine, probably half a million, how many people take heroin, probably quarter of a million. So we did a lot of the research and he read the things and corrected everything. And I said, Paul, you're a complete bore. You haven't actually given me a story. It's all facts, facts, facts. Tell me something about your life. Tell me something much as I pressed him, excuse me, Ben. Mm -hmm. Much as I pressed him, I couldn't get anything out of him. So finally, we're leaving the room one day, just below here where I am now. We were leaving the room, Paul and I going to lunch. And he said, I said, does anything annoy you, Paul? And he said, well, do you know, Jeffrey, there was this man who I knew he was a top burglar. He knew I knew I'd been following him for years. The bloody man used to send me a Harrods hamper every year. And I had to give it back down to security everywhere. I, I, towards the end, I didn't bother to even open it. And I said to him, that is a real story. And of course, it's the first five pages. That one sentence became the first five pages of the new book. And uh, so now I have a joke with John, John Sutherland and with Michelle Roycroft, I keep saying, because we've now gone on, we've gone on to police corruption and are getting the facts on that, on the third book. And I keep saying to both of them, give me a hamper. And they know straight away what I mean. I want an inside story that is almost unbelievable, but the public will enjoy. And I only need a sentence and then I can turn it into a story. Yes, I love that. And I'm absolutely sure that um, Miles Faulkner will, will at some point get his commandments properly and not escape and not do everything else in, in his oily sort of way. But uh, you've got... You've, you've got, got a problem there, Ben. You've got a problem you've there. Got seven books, you've got say, seven books to do it in, so it's going to be fun. They like Miles Faulkner. That's the problem. It, it's weird. I don't know. I, I, I actually do quite like him in a weird sort of there way. There you are. <laughs> but um, so I, I also heard in another interview that you kind of felt that Harry Clifton was you. It was kind of, there was, there was you. However, I was sort of watching and uh, William Warwick unfold in front of me thinking, this is, Jeffrey Archer's based in, based William Warwick on himself. It's a, uh, that's a, without a doubt. Is that not the case or? Uh... I think, I think every author, there's a bound to be in any author then, uh, what I would call autobiographical bits, bound to be. I always say to anyone who comes to see me and says, I want to write a book, Jeffrey. And 
And I say, write what you know about and feel at ease with. Write about the people you know about. I mean, weave the story around them. Don't be frightened to do that. So yes, I suspect having been in politics, having loved the art world, having enjoyed being a charity auctioneer, uh, having enjoyed business, having enjoyed travel, having enjoyed in particular art, they'll get into the books and they'll be a bit of me. I think there's more of John Sutherland in, uh, in William. I think there's quite a bit of me in Harry Clifton, but I think there's more of John Sutherland who told me a wonderful story once. I said, well, it must have been tricky for you, John. You will remember this, I hope. It must be tricky for you, John. You come into the police with a degree. Uh, you're, you're, you speak like a public school boy because you were. Uh, you must have had quite a hard time. He said, well, yes, but if you work very hard, uh, they tease you, but they, 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 they like you if you work hard. So I, I thought the only way around was work. But I said, yes, but tell me about the teasing. He said, well, I remember as a young constable, I shot, this is in the book, of course, I shot into the police station one morning and the S sergeant, a real old, been at it for years, said, said uh, Southern, uh, come here. There's a man in the cells in a terrible place, in a terrible situation. Take this prescription down to Boots now and get it done immediately. And he said, I ran all the way to Boots. And I went to the front of the queue. I immediately apologized. I was in uniform as a young constable. I immediately apologized and said, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's an emergency. I gave it to this lady behind the counter and she read it, she read the note and she turned around and gave him um, a packet of condoms. Well, uh, he went red as a beetroot and walked out and read the note. He said, I'm a young constable, and I've at last found a girlfriend, but I'm not quite sure what to do next. <laughs> and that was a true story. And he remembers it as a young constable being teased by a desk sergeant. So I often say to John and to Michelle, those are the stories the public will love because they'll know they're true. Mm, lovely, lovely. I was more alluding to the fact in the book you described William Warwick as being a great sprinter. Um, which um, I mean, obviously, and uh, and a wing three quarter was that surely that was that your position? Yes, but I was never any good. Enjoyed my running, and to be honest with you, I was frightened in the winter months playing for my school on the wing. Frightened of getting injured because I was far more interested in getting me in the England school team for the hundred yards. The problem with my school was actually I saw myself naturally as the captain of the cricket team, and indeed one day captain of the England cricket team. Uh, my problem was I couldn't bat bowl or field, which might be considered a minor disadvantage. So uh, the rugby was a secondary thing. The running was the first thing. But I, I, I'm so old at 80 that 60, 50, 65 years ago, when I was at school, uh, athletics wasn't considered a proper sport. You either played rugby and cricket, uh, or you, want to, you, you couldn't get the full colours unless you were... Uh, unless you were uh, uh, playing rugby or cricket. And indeed, when I left uh, my little school in, in Somerset called Wellington, uh, uh, the headmaster just about, in fact, I will tell you, he mentioned to the assembled gathering on speech day that I had been chosen to run for uh, England against uh, Scotland, Ireland and Wales after he'd given a full report on the third 11 cricket team results. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. That's uh, very funny. And and I also I, I was reading through your um, your decade diary on your website, and you described the last run you did. Uh, you were being overtaken by a camel, a phone box, and and a girl walking. Is that is that true? Well, I I did a, a, a charity auction marathon. It took. I was too old. I was sixty two at the time. Uh, I should have done it when I was a young man, but I didn't. I did it at 62, it took five hours and 20 minutes. You're quite right. I was overtaken by a uh, telephone, uh, by a letterbox. I was overtaken by a centipede. I was overtaken. I didn't mind so much the centipede, except centipede kept stopping and having photographs with the crowd and then overtaking me again. So the humiliation was not being overtaken by the centipede. It was being overtaken regularly by the centipede. But it was an, an amazing experience and raised half a million for different charities. So it was worthwhile. But I'd never do it again. And I wouldn't recommend it to anyone over the age of 30. 
no, I've just I've just entered a half marathon myself. But anyway, we'll leave that. Um, so we sort of digressed a little bit off there. You you touched on the characters within the books. Um, so Roycroft uh, appears actually as a character in the book. So she's obviously been an advisor, um, but also a character. So so what do you have to do to become a character in the book? Well, what's well, the joy with Michelle, which is her real name, and but in the book she's Jackie. I liked the name Jackie better. But she was very cross with me for calling her Jackie. But it gave me a human being who I could physically look at and write about. So the person, so Jackie, or Michelle, really is in the book. If you see how she dresses and how she behaves and what she does, it's very much her character. So I looked at her and I looked at uh, John Sutherland. I looked at both of them and thought, I'll steal you both. I'll make one of you. Uh, William Warwick, and I'll make the other one uh, working on the on the art squad uh, when they first meet um, a detective, and I'll look at you both and see what you do in real life, and try and put that down on paper. Don't invent someone if you don't have to. For example, let me just say that if I was writing a book and this was a chapter in it. Why wouldn't I describe your ridiculous shirt and your beard and your hair? And why wouldn't I try and work out what it is on the shelves behind you, which look absolutely fascinating? Because then you see, then you see, Ben, I don't have to go out and invent the whole thing. There's some wonderful objects on the shelves behind you. My wife's and there's favorite. you in your ridiculous shirt. And that my readers have got straight away. They understand. So I don't have to invent anything. It's all there in front of my eyes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, all, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the knickknacks on the shelf are my wife's. Um, uh, I love them. I think they look years, great. 30, well, nearly 30 years of marriage. We've, um, we have a mutual arrangement. She, she, she clutters the place and I don't. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> nice. Um, so all your books seem incredibly well researched. I, um, I, I kind of put something almost Dennis Wheatley about them because Dennis Wheatley was famous for doing that. Is, 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 do you really love yes, the research side of, side of things? Well, I enjoy it, but I, to be honest, you, I, I'm, I won't tell you what it is because it'll tell you what the third book's about, but I've been researching today for the third book. And I went straight back to uh, Michelle Bicroft and Johnny Sutherland and said, look, I've read these three books you say I have to read to understand. A background for this particular subject but I want to meet the two people who were involved one is a detective inspector the and a woman a detective inspector woman and one is a reach reach the rank of chief inspector and they have been spending the last couple of days very kindly arranging for me to meet them because I want to say to them when you did that and it was covered well in the press or you were famous for it what isn't getting into the book? What are you not writing that I can put in my novel? Tell me some secrets. Because when you, when you research a human being, you get much more of a feel of it. If you read, if, if you read a, a great biography on, say, someone like Field Marshal Montgomery, who, for me, was a great hero when I was a schoolboy. But I never met him. So I never got how he walked, how he sat down, how he moved his head, what he did. You, you, if you meet the person, you suddenly go, wow, yes, I can see, oh, how interesting, yes. And now in the case of Michelle Roycroft, for example, she is as mad as a hatter and as brave as a lion. She told me two stories, one about going into a drug den when the police sent her forward to knock on the door to get the door open because she's an attractive, the young lady, and they, when they saw a stupid policeman stood up behind the hedge, and she was dragged in. So she's inside with three blooming great six foot men beating her up. Frankly, if I'd seen a six foot three man, I'd have run the other way. So she's as brave as a lion. So when she tells stories like that, you see the personality as well. And you think, wow, what a brave person. And when John Sutherland talks to you about the way he treats human beings during a murder, you think that, then you see William Warwick and the way he behaves. And so 
the answer to your question, man, is researching people is every bit as researching books. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you've also said about um, uh, when writing on a subject, talk about something, what you know about. And, uh, and I could tell from, uh, from Nothing Ventured, it's obviously about artwork, and that's clearly incredibly close to your heart. Um, uh, you obviously use a little bit of license with the, 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 the paintings you choose and the, the geographical locations uh, that they they reside and 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 also the name of the the the, the museum the the gallery um, it seems like a amalgam of I don't know two I could I could get the Ashmolean oh, the Ashmolean and the Fitzwilliam yeah it's the Fitzwilliam is it okay because there's the another Fitzwilliam one the... and the Ashmolean have become the Fitzmillian yeah 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 so um, uh, was 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 talk about artwork always a part of your kind of um, the, the the reason to do it or because you I'm very not quickly about moved art. away to the drugs industry. I absolutely, well, I'll come to drugs in a minute. I'm nuts about it. I've loved it for, I mean, my home whole life is, and they're on every wall, everywhere you look. And my idea of a holiday is to go to Italy for uh, a week with two friends. Uh, one is a scholar and the other is an art uh, gallery owner. And we do one city, we do two cities a year. We couldn't, of course, the last year. We used to do two cities a year. We would go to a, a city and we would choose, he would choose, Simon, the chief one, would choose the three galleries we were going to visit. We would then choose within the gallery the five paintings we were going to look at and possibly two sculptures because he said, the trouble with big galleries is you march into them and by the time you might get to a masterpiece, you're actually shattered and tired. So he would do all the research and he would take us to the masterpieces and then give a short lecture on them. So I've had the privilege between the ages of uh, sort of 35 and now 80, of visiting many, many great treasures in Italy and being lectured by two very clever people on them. So here we are years later. I've got all that knowledge stuck in there. So I, you're quite right, my love of art comes out big time, uh, but it's really, it's a genuine love of art. I'm, I'm a, a, a nutcase at that level. And, uh, but I have these two people, these two scholars, who never stop teaching me. And I think if you, if you, if it goes in, if you have that sort of brain, then it can come out, and you can be casual about it—a line here, a line there, a comment there—about a great artist that you've learnt, you've learnt something about uh, a human being, and you can slot it in very gently. And uh, the reader, I hope the reader is fascinated by that. They said, oh, I didn't know that about Rembrandt. I didn't know that about Picasso. Uh, because I've picked it up over many years and reading many books. Mm. Any reason the syndics? What, any reason on the Rubens? Well, my wife's uh, a syndic at, uh, was a syndic um, at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where he was a Don, now chairman of the Science Museum. So yes, I stole that. And again with Mary. Mary is always, I mean, uh, Emma in the Clifton Chronicles is Mary. And there's a lot of Mary in Beth in, uh, oh, in the Warwicks. Uh, and I, I, the way she speaks, the way she does things, how very different she is to me, and how very different she is as a human being. So she, she has a love of art. But she loves most of all, she loves working with committees and working with people and getting things done. I've watched her over the years, certainly in the Clifton Chronicles, you see Emma taking on bigger and bigger responsibilities until uh, the Queen, until she goes to the House of Lords. And I, I took Mary all the way through in, in the book in that sense. And of course, uh, Mary has been, the Queen has made Mary a day. She's now named Mary for her work at the hospital and her work at the Science Museum. So, yes, I, I go back to this point I make with people who want to write, write about, write about what you know about. Uh, and don't be frightened that you think your world is not big enough. Jane Austen lived in a tiny village and wrote her books in her bedroom without her parents knowing. And because she could, because she was a genius, because she was a brilliant storyteller, wonderful command of language. She wrote five or six of the greatest books. 
And so, the, I mean, that, that obviously then naturally raises the question why you then focus so much, the, the, the new book, uh, um, on drugs, which clearly I, you don't look like the sort of person who spent too much time in a crack den, you know, so. No, I don't smoke, I don't drink, uh, but, and indeed every book will be a different subject. So it's police corruption next and then murder. So number two was drugs. I just had this idea. I live in Lambeth. You're talking to me now in Lambeth. But behind me is the whole of South London. And out there somewhere, uh, they told me there are some really big, what they call slaughters, what the police call slaughters, which is a drug den. And what I'm not willing to tell you, because you know, because you've read the book, what I'm not willing to tell you is the commander says, we have a way of finding out. And the young, the young sergeant, William Warwick says, how will we do that, sir? I can't tell you until it snows. I remember that's the end of a chapter. And I got that from the police. I got that from John Sutherland. He said, we couldn't find out until it snowed. And I'm not going to tell you or the people why. I mean, not, not uh, probably surprisingly, um, that storyline i instantly knew what it meant mainly because we had oh. a very, we had a very similar case in tring believe it or not in what uh, in oh, tring, you, oh really we really? had a very similar case in tring where somebody was stung when it snowed and uh, they were ah, done so, so you ah well done, sir. i thought tring was a sort of respectable middle class place i didn't think it was full oh, of well it, believe it or not it is but uh, there's little <laughs> no, no, nooks and crannies you know you know they even allow me to live here so who knows but uh, um, uh, just a quick note to everyone, you, now you can ask some questions. I've got, uh, I can already see one or two uh, coming in. So uh, if you want to use the chat function, send a message. Um, we've got about 18 minutes left. So, um, uh, and given how verbose uh, Jeffrey seems to be, then I don't know if we have more time for more than yes. four, three or four questions. But uh, let, me, let me start with, um, Niall's got one here. Uh, the Prodigal Daughter is the best novel I've ever read about American politics. Do you have any inclination to write anything about the current state of US politics? How, well, it's a kind how, question. I love American politics. And isn't it farcical that the sequel to Cain and Abel, uh, that the prodigal daughter was the story of the first woman president of the United States based on Florentina Cain, and or originally Florentina Rosnowski, and then she marries Cain's son and becomes Florentina Cain. And here we are, 40 years later, and we still haven't had a woman president. Meantime, we've had two women prime ministers in this country, one in Germany, brilliant one in New Zealand at the moment. I, I can't imagine how the Americans haven't worked out that women are rather good at leading countries, but still. So the answer to your question is that I have a fascination with American politics. I, just before I came to you, because I had half an hour between one interview and coming to you, I, I watch CBNC and C, CNN. I'm fascinated by what's happening between Trump and Biden and the whole process. And a week today, or is it a week tomorrow, uh, I should be up all night watching the results. Mm, absolutely. Um... Mind you, I have to tell you, I think... Uh, Biden will win easily. Do you? Yes, I wow. do. Wow. Okay. Um, simple reason. Simple reason. 62 million people have already voted. That is the highest at this point in history by 50%. They're not voting for Trump. I'll tell you that. I do. I, I, <laughs> I, I went. Oh, no, it's all right. It's, um, that, that would surprise me. Trump just feels like one of those. <laughs> He's a Miles Faulkner who seems to somehow win. Uh, I agree. Even there though... is something about him in that way that's remarkable. He seems to be. I think the vote is too high. It's too high, Ben. 60 million now. They'll probably, usually in the United States, the vote, as Obama pointed out yesterday, the vote is only 55%. It does look as if it's going to be between 65 and 70%. That will not help Trump. Yes. Good. Um, so I've got a question. Uh, Craig, <coughs> oh, Craig Lawrence, I was talking to him earlier. He's um, brigadier in the Gurkhas, would you believe it? Um, ah, stand to attention. Do you worry about how much of your books are dialogue or description? 
Uh, Craig is a writer as well. He started writing since leaving the army. Uh, do you have a rule of thumb? You can't, uh, uh, Brigadier, you can't have a rule of thumb. You must do what suits you. Some people will spend the first three pages describing a human being right the way down to a, a hair coming out of their nose. Other people <coughs> are heavy on dialogue. Storytellers are heavy on dialogue. Writers are heavy on description. I am a storyteller, so you get a lot of dialogue. I like courtroom scenes. I like dialogue. But there are other writers, and I read them all the time, who will give you three pages without the two characters even speaking to each other. They'll describe the room. They'll describe both the characters so that you know them clearly and you know where they are. That's, that's different to what I do. So what I would say to you, Brigadier, if I may be allowed to, is do what suits you. Don't, don't, don't do what you think the publisher will want. That won't work. Don't write a ghost story because they're popular. Don't write a sex story because that's the in thing. Don't rely on violence and bad language. You don't need any of that. Tell a story. And if I may say so, if you uh, were a brigadier in the Turkish, Arguably, dare I say it, the bravest regiment the world has ever known. In VCs galore, and what a history, what a history. You've met some of the most exciting and brave people who've walked the face of the earth, and some of the most intensely loyal people who've walked the face of the earth. Please tell me about them in a novel. Fantastic, yes, very good. Um, Mike James sent me, this was an emailed question earlier actually, um, so you're a best-selling author, uh, an excellent after-dinner speaker, an amazing fundraiser for charities, uh, he's referring to your auction, auctioneering work, um, would you have exchanged it all to have been Prime Minister? I'd exchange it all to be captain of the England cricket team, I'd have exchanged it all for 30 century, I, I, would I exchange it for Prime Minister is a very fair question. I think you always want to do what you didn't do. If that isn't double done. But I'll tell you a story. Very recently, my wife and I went to uh, Sajid Javid's uh, 50th birthday party. Because uh, we're old friends. And he was on my London team when I stood for mayor. And uh, on the next table was the Prime Minister, uh, who was then, uh, Sajid was then, a Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the Prime Minister was on the next table and Mary wanted to talk to him about the Science Museum, what they were doing. And so he, he very kindly was talking to both of us and he said, did you know I'd written a novel, Geoffrey? And I said, yes, I do, Prime Minister. He said it was a disaster. It, it failed completely. He said, secretly, I looked at you and thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a popular novelist. That's what I want to do. And uh, I've ended up as prime minister. I said, well, I'm a popular novelist. I wanted to be prime minister. So I think you reach a certain age, probably 70, when you look back on your life and you say, could I have done that? Could I have done the other? It's foolish to look back. Be satisfied with what you've done and enjoyed and be very thankful. In my case, immensely thankful for have 270 million readers, whatever it is, uh, out there uh, and, and the pleasure I've had from the letters and from contacts and from the kind things people say, uh, uh, that's wonderful. It's a real privilege. Mm. I know, I, I, um, I, in my homework I was doing in preparation for this, I, I did actually read your, um, the first prison diary, which was the, mm. um, uh, which I thought was jaw-dropping. It's, it's, it's an, an amazing piece of literature. I, I adored the lines where you said, are you listening, Home Secretary, which just so, so evocative of um, uh, that you, you, know, you saw problems and you knew there were solutions and you, you uttered simple ways, cost-free ways of, of, of resolving problems in the, in, the, in the prison service. Have you done uh, any sort of follow-up to that? Have you maintained... Uh, well, I, I, you're very kind to say that because I suppose that was political experience really combined with what I watched in front of me, what really annoyed me, and I made it very clear to the Home Secretary of the day that it annoyed me, was that if you swept the floors in a prison, you got £2.40. If you worked in the kitchens, you got £2.40. 
an hour. If you, only menial tasks, you got two pounds 40 an hour. But if you did education, you got one pound 40 an hour. I said, this doesn't make any sense, Home Secretary. Why don't you give some incentive here? Why don't you give more for education than you would for cleaning floors? Why don't you give incentive for people who get O levels? Incentive for people who get A levels? Incentive for, I saw people get O levels, A levels, and degrees. But the one that most horrified me was business who said to me, Jeffrey, I can't afford one pound forty. I won't be able to get my cigarettes. Well, I thought this is madness. This man is not going to education because he can't pay for his cigarettes. And I think, in, in reference to your follow-up, I think you'll find pretty well every prison in Britain today, education is now paid the same as menial tasks. So that little battle was won. Some others weren't. I think I, th I also think your um, contribution to the random drug testing, um, which which obviously had a scandalising effect on the uh, on the prisons in terms of drug addiction, um, but but clearly the the people making those decisions had no idea on on what they were what the decisions they were making the effect it was going to have. Well, you can't. Neither did I. I had the privilege in the DCAT prison of being put in charge of the hospital, and I had three. I worked with three very able doctors. And they taught me about drugs because I'd never taken a drug in my life. They taught me about drugs. And it was a heck of an experience having three doctors. They came in two days a week every, for six days. And, uh, the, and the governor, they said to the governor, are we allowed to treat him as an equal? Are we allowed to tell him? And the governor said, no, you aren't, but do. And they, the governor was very sensible. He realized that I wanted to learn about drugs. I was passionate to find out the truth. And, uh, and it was horrific. I mean, for a, a, a middle-class boy like me, what some of these children, I had, the day I left prison, a kid came to see me who was 24 years old, he sat on the end of the bed, and he said, I'll swap places with you, Jeffrey. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm 24, I'm a drug addict. You're 60, uh, you've got a wife and family, You've got a job to do, you're a writer. You've got lots of friends. Uh, I'd like to change places, please. I'll be 62 and be you and you can be. He was found in a ditch in Boston with a needle in his arm three years later. Mm. So you that in my sort of silly little world, I'd never experienced or gone anywhere near. So I was able to pass that on to other members of parliament. I was able to pass that on to the Home Secretary and say, I had absolutely no idea, but in the last two years, it's really been an education. Fantastic, fantastic. You met um, a number of amazing characters in, in prison. The one that struck uh, a chord with me, and I know it did with you, was Billy Little. Um, oh, you know, Billy was such a sad case. He was a Glasgow murderer, in for life. He hated me from the day he met me. I was everything he disapproved of. I was a Tory, I was wealthy, I was successful, I was fit, all of that. And I, I, when I left Belmarsh to go to uh, another prison, I said to him, now, get off your stupid high horse. I'll tell her what I'll do, Billy. But I knew he was bright, bright as a button. I said, tell her what I'll do, Billy. I'll pay for any book you want and anything that costs money if it's involved with education. So for the next, I think it was the next five years, six, seven years, I covered all those bills. And he got a Bachelor of Arts degree. Left prison, became a drunk, was dead within two years. Oh, no. Oh, I'm glad to see you throw your head in the air, Ben, because I thought, here was I doing something wonderful and noble. And he was dead within two years of leaving prison. And he got his Bachelor of Arts, I went to the ceremony. I returned to prison and watched him have the hood put over his head. And I did think then, he said, oh, I'm coming out in a year's time. I said, get in touch with me immediately, you come out. I did think we're okay. We've got him on track, he's got a degree. Truth is, looking back on it, he told me when he started falling apart again, degree was fine, but he did still find it very hard to get a job. Very, very difficult. But surely his writing, I mean, you, you, you published some, bit, some of his writing in the book, and um, 
I mean, that's stacked up so brilliantly. Surely a publisher would have, on your say so, would have would have snapped it up. Yes, I hoped so, but no, it didn't happen. And the other one was even worse, Fletch. Uh, and again, a murderer. He'd murdered the paedophile uh, who mistreated him, whatever word you want to use. Uh, and he didn't want to live. He just died in prison. I went to see him and said, now get a grip of yourself. We're gonna get you out, we're gonna get you going again. He said, no, Jeffrey, no. Mm. And he just died in prison. So that again was an amazing experience, an amazingly awful experience. And I saw you raise your head when I talked about Billy Little. So you can get these things into books and you can get these things over to people through fiction. And in that way, it was a privilege to meet them. And there, for the grace of God, any one of us might be if, you know, God knows we've been lucky. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, Craig came back, he said, well, thank you for the great advice. Um, he, if I'm permitted another question, who is your favorite contemporary author writing in the same genre as yourself? Well, that is a pointed question, Craig, and I refuse to answer it. But I will tell you, <laughs> to come straight back to this wonderful bookshop, get hold of Ben by the neck and say, I want. Stefan Zweig, uh, he's only written two novels because he sadly uh, committed suicide. He was uh, an Austrian who believed that Hitler would win the war and that he was Jewish. He ran, ran to America with his girlfriend. They got married and he committed suicide. But I, I, I do think Aware of Pity is a masterpiece, Craig. And if you read it, you will see, uh, for me, one of the great writers of all time. Beautiful writer and a beautiful story. I was sitting at a table for dinner and he was on the other side of the room. He was a national hero, of course. Everybody knew the general. They knew what he'd done for his country, and they knew how much the people loved him. I was sorry not to speak to him. And as I left the room and put on my coat to go, he said, may I walk home with you? And I said, yes, of course. And he said, as we walked down the street, you think you know my story? I do indeed, sir, I said. No, you don't. But I've waited for a long time. But the um, next page. He's a genius. He is an absolute genius. And I reckon anybody watching this, if you're a nonfiction, if you're watching this and you're nonfiction, he's almost more famous for his nonfiction. Europe, his European stories, the story of Europe before Hitler's rise is unquestionably a work of genius. And is hailed by every serious writer as a work of genius. But if, Craig, you want to look at a novel, uh, Beware of Pity is a masterpiece. Mm, fantastic. So we're, we're literally a minute or so away. Can I, <clears throat> I'm going to finish with a little personal note to say, um, Jeffrey, we have met. And um, we met. Um, but you're not wearing that shirt, we didn't. <laughs> I was wearing my pajamas, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is back in the, uh, must it either be the late 70s or early 80s. Um, and uh, you came and did a, a fundraiser for, um, it was a, uh, it was for Sir Giles Shaw, I think, who was. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, and, yes. Uh, so you came up to Yorkshire, where I'm from, and, um, and came to, a, to our family home and did this um did this fundraiser oh um, which um, thank you for remembering so i was um well i have to say i i i i just i appeared in my pajamas at one point as a this high or something and it's it's actually the rest of my family i'm the youngest of six who told me about it so i i didn't remember when i told them i was interviewing you it was uh, it was quite a, just you've a met him before my wife had this experience quite recently she was uh she, when they opened the galleries again the first gallery they opened was the national gallery and they invited the chairman of every national gallery and the uh, managing director of every, and Mary went. And as she walked up the stairs, Oliver Dowden was walking up the steps as well. And she said, good evening, Secretary of State. You won't know me. My name is Mary Archer, and I'm chairman of the Science Museum. She said, he said, what do you mean, Mary? Don't you remember when we last met? And she said, no, Secretary of State, I don't apologize. I don't remember. Oh, yes, you gave away the prizes at my school, and you gave me a prize. <laughs> 
Yes, it's, uh, isn't that a funny story? But um, um, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my us. great pleasure, Ben. You've ticked through to eight o'clock, so I have to be honourable and let you go off. To, you're doing a radio interview at nine, aren't you? Or I am indeed. So, um, yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who um, bought the book. To all of you who haven't picked up the book, do get into the shop and pick them up. Um, we've, uh, yeah, we've got a, a little stash, extra stash of um, signed Jeffrey Archers. And uh, thank you so much. So I'm, um, I, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you so much. And Jeffrey. And uh, thank you very much. And can I wish your bookshop and your readers absolutely keep well and keep reading. And when the third book comes out, please let's do this again. Maybe we can I, even do it in, in, in person. You're not that person. far from Tring. Yes, much more fun. Fantastic. So thank you so much and um, see you again very soon. Indeed, sir. Thank you very much. Massive thanks to Jeffrey for that uh, wonderful interview. Uh, and I do hope he likes my shirt selection this time. Um, as we uh, mentioned earlier, we've got uh, signed copies of his book. Do give us a call. 01442827653. Um, all other purchase blurb is available in the text below this video. Thank you so much. Do subscribe to uh, our future YouTube videos and uh, we'll see you next time.